my year because nothing is my year, it's all of our years. Um, and we talked about our strat plan, what things we wanted to accomplish, knowing it may take several years to accomplish all the things that we want to work on. And I thought that was really neat to do. Um, and Laura and I sat down to talk about that as well to figure out here's, here's what our thoughts are. How does that work with our strat plan? How can we do it? Here's what my role is. Here's what your role is. So, you know, you don't, you don't want to assume that the other person knows or that has the expectation. And I thought the dialogue that you and I had, it was very open. It was very forthright. And I thought it worked out very well because it's not about me. It's about what's best for our members. And we really brainstormed what was best for our members. I, I agree, and I, I think one of the things that, that we used is a template that I got from NAR a while back, and it, it was called a prenuptial agreement, and really it just defines every, you know, the role of, of the president, the role of the leader, and to have that dialogue about how do you like to communicate? Do you like to communicate by phone, or do you prefer email or text? Are you a morning person or an evening person, or do you just prefer to be contacted during regular business hours? All of those kind of things really help set the stage for a successful year so you know what the expectations are of the other person and you don't have any surprises. Um, the, the other thing that, that I, I think was very uh, good in, in your approach was, was just talking about the strategic plan beyond the year, beyond your presidency and involving the other leaders so it gets them prepared to serve as president or chairman of the board as, as they move along. And that has been incredibly helpful during this past couple of weeks and, and having to shift and be a little flexible with some of the things that, that we've had to do in our operations. We have been able to communicate uh, in a different way, but we, we had already set the stage and set the boundaries of how we wanted to do that up front. So, so I feel like, um, uh, your your leadership on that has has really helped us navigate these challenging waters. I think it helped because we the leadership team and I like we are a team. It's not just a person that I saw at a meeting and I won't see again for another couple of months. You really when you start it's all about relationships. Our entire business is about relationships, and so this is no different. And that's really the one thing that I took forward is building that solid relationship because we all know stuff comes up no matter what year it is. There's always something comes up and you need your team. You need your team with you. You need all to be working towards the same common goal. Yeah, and I, and I think the one thing too is that we manage to all stay in our lane. We might we might need to call on one another to to come over and help or or give give a hand or at least a, a, a some advice, but but we all stay in our lanes and and we all um, are are committed to the same goals. You know, uh, that kind of leads into the kind of leads into the accountability piece. Um, you know, obviously we, we've got the, the strategic plan and, and our goals set, but um, goodness gracious, I think we've all seen over the past couple of weeks that um, do you, really, you really have to be flexible and uh, learn how to, um, to, to uh, challenge yourself and, and get creative. Um, do you wanna, you wanna talk about a little bit about your accountability principles that you've got in place? Yes. One of the things that I would say to all the association executives, because you guys do this every day, day in and day out, and we turn over every year, I would say to you, don't assume that your volunteer leadership knows what you expect of them or what they should expect in this role. And I think that was one thing that was always very helpful to me, that the expectations were set up front so I knew. I am very schedule driven. I was given the schedule of where I needed to be, when I needed to be there, and I could plan accordingly and I can plan my business around it. So I would just say that helps me with the accountability piece. Um, and it helps, I mean, I know it helps my fellow team members as well. So just, I think that's important. And also when we host meetings, it's really, if we, if we need to meet, we'll meet. Like I'm all in, but I don't wanna meet just to meet. I'm not doing this because I wanna put something on my resume. I'm not checking a box. I'm doing it because I want to, better my association, I want to better my team. That's the way I look at it. So I think that's been held us both accountable to make sure we're accomplishing the mission that fits with our strat plan, that fits with all the things. And now we've got this curveball thrown at us. We're better prepared because we know what we're trying to do. We're knowing what's the best for our members. And we adjust. 
Absolutely. One one thing that that I wanted to share with the group is is a book uh, that I use when when we start our year um, and do our mm -hmm. leadership training with our committee chairs and vice chairs and and our our board of directors. And it's a book called Your Director Hat. And I I don't know if everybody can see this or not, but anyway, here's the little book. It's a quick read and it it really covers a lot of cool things. But it it also gives you um, a, a, a lighthearted way to remind people of the hat that they wear when they come into a meeting and when they're representing the association. And I have heard Rennie say more times than one in a board meeting, reminding the, the directors what hat they're wearing, that they're representing the 4,200 members that we have in our organization, that they're not representing their personal interests. So if if anybody is interested in this book, I'll be happy to to send you the information on it. But I, it's just a a cool little tool and easy read that that we refer to because we you know I, I think our our philosophy Rennie has, has been we work hard but we play hard too. We try to keep it fun. We all have baseball caps with the CCAR logo on them and our name on the back, um, just as a gentle reminder of the hat that we wear and the people that we represent. Um, oh, it's what, there's no personal agenda. It's, it's for the best of our organization. It's not me personally. It's not my company. It's for the association, and and we do we do remind people of that. Yeah, and I, I think that's key. Is just just always keeping in mind who you're representing, and that it's 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 more it's it's all about the member and and not at all about you. Servant leadership is is something that I learned from my mentor many many years ago. And, and it, it still rings true today that you must, to, to serve in a capacity like this, you must be a servant leader. I think that's it for us. Travis, well, thank you. Thank you, Laura and Rennie. What great information. And we really appreciate the big picture view and, um, and servant leadership is certainly something that people talk about. And it's nice to see it in action. <clears throat> so, thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. So, um, now we're going to turn it over to Travis Kessler and Cindy Bulla, um, TAR's chairman of the board, to discuss strategy, goals, and evaluation. So, Travis, do you want to take the reins here? Uh, Cindy, I think you're going to start for us. This <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Travis and Kyle. And uh, the, what I would love to start with is just to kind of build on what uh, we, we just heard, and that is that any, any strategic plan and all of the, the goals and priorities and ultimately the evaluate, evaluation that follows that has to start with a culture, and, and that's an overall culture. And, and I'm going to say that while our, our membership is, while our, uh, the hierarchy of our organization is member-driven, because of the continuity and the longevity of our, our staff members, particularly our AEs, um, that actually really probably the culture building probably starts at a staff level. And, and then what happens is as, as these teams of elected leaders come through, um, the way I like to look at it is each time one team member rolls off and a new one rolls on, it's really a new team. So it has an entirely new dynamic. Um, we are very careful in our culture um, to, to build upon two key uh, uh, it, goals, and that is truth and transparency. And so um, we have Travis as our CEO and our AE as our anchor. And, uh, and then each of us as elected leaders begin the process from the time we roll on and then each successive year until we take the reins as the chairman of the board. And, and that allows a level of continuity with the elected leadership that, that um, gives all our members and certainly the staff members who try to execute our vision a, a level of continuity so that they're not struggling with one single member's goal or vision for the association and um, and we're all accountable to one another to make sure that everything we do ties back to that strategic plan. 
So obviously, Texas is a huge state, a tremendously diverse, and uh, both geographically and in every other sense of that word, uh, level of membership. I, I personally am based in Amarillo, Texas. Travis is based in Austin. We have other team members as far as 800 miles away down in the uh, uh, valley area at the tip of Texas. So um, we're all so spread out that we're fairly used to having a level of physical distance between us. So that has helped us very, very much in the transition to doing everything uh, for the last couple of weeks and for the, the, the next uh, however long it takes for us to, to continue in this vein. That has helped us sort of move through, trust one another despite the distance. Um, uh, Travis and I are always joking that I, I personally am closer to Denver than I am Dallas or Austin. So that's kind of how far apart we are spread up here. But um, uh, again, because we've built that trust and we've spent years building it before I became the, the chairman of the board, um, Travis kind of knows what he can expect from me. I've, I know exactly what I can expect for him and, from him and his team. And that helps us move into um, uh, and stay within the lanes or the boundaries that we were talking about for each of our uh, 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 roles in the organization. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Travis so he can talk specifically about the strategic plan. All right. Thank you, Cindy. And you set that tone very well. Uh, and looking at the best practices for us uh, as a state association, as Cindy said, uh, we're we're a large organization, 126,000 members. Uh, we have uh, uh, 75 local associations, and and we have a staff of of about 72 in our state offices in in Austin. So it's important that we enhance our communication opportunities and and how we communicate to set up that culture that Cindy was referring to. You know, it's so important to have a relationship, uh, and, and we don't see each other on a daily basis as much as a local association would. So we've got to create that, that truth and transparency that Cindy was referring to, because we've got to work remotely. And I commend all of you on the, the webinar today for taking advantage of an opportunity like this to communicate and take an education session uh, remotely. Uh, in today's time and the crisis that we're in, we're having to do business as an association and as brokers uh, to do business remotely. And so taking advantage of this opportunity is no different than what we should be doing on a regular basis and learning how to, to do our communication skills to enhance the relationship. So our best practice as the Texas Realtors Group uh, that Cindy and I want to present involves our strat planning, our strategic planning process. The strength of our relationship between staff and leadership is to understand priorities. For us, understanding those priorities are identified in that strategic plan. It helps us to not start over every year with new goals. It's the continuity of that plan that adds value to what we do. It enhances our relationship because it gives us the common goals for an association. And it's that common goal that Cindy referred to is that it creates the continuity and the culture of that continuity with an entire leadership team. So as you can see on this slide, our plan drives the association. It's our roadmap. It's for the organization's long-term uh, organizational path. But our plan drives the budget and the budget drives the resources. And for staff and volunteer priorities, that's, that's just critical because it reinforces our respective lanes that, that Cindy was referring to as our chairman. It reinforces that our leaders and our members actually present those visionary concepts that we all want to aspire to and to have as a successful organization. But as leaders and members, there are boots on the ground to know what those member needs and expectations are. And then what it does for us as the staff of a, of a state association, it gives us, and in particular, me as the CEO, it gives me the path and the direction, the resources, and the staffing to be able to implement what those common goals and priorities are. And so it's really important to understand the strength of the organization. The best practice for communicating and enhancing that relationship is to be on the same page, the same continuity of the culture, to understand what it is would be our priorities. So Cindy, why don't you talk about the, the priority and our goal setting process 
and how we do that in Texas. Thank you, Travis. So um, that STRAT plan sets uh, visionary goals and um, strategic goals for that our members want the association to achieve to best deliver to them. And then we take those as elected leadership and we uh, sort of develop priorities for our staff. Okay, in order to achieve the strategic goals of our membership, then we need staff to do this, this, and this. Always remembering that, that uh, elected leaders are the visionaries and staff, are, is, that role is execution. Um, and uh, we always remind one another that we are experts in real estate and the staff, we, we hire world-class staff and they are the experts in what they do. So yes, Members uh, are, this is a member driven organization, but it's literally nuts to hire world class staff that are experts in their particular fields and then not listen to them. So maybe they're not the, the ultimate decision makers, but incorporating their recommendations into the decisions that are made by members is critical and it, and it would be incredibly foolish not to weigh those in very heavily. And, and we do that priority setting. We start with an orientation of our new member. Remember I said our members, uh, are, are, to keep our team cohesive and keep that continuity so that Travis doesn't have a whole new um, uh, vision to deal with every year. We, we start with an orient orientation of the new team member that rolls on. And we make sure that new team member understands that it's not, a, it's not a, an I thing, it's a we thing, and how the team concept is going to work, how, what we expect of them. Then we do a retreat, and, and that can be a virtual retreat or a physical retreat, but the, the five of us get together and we talk about how we can develop priorities for, that will, that will uh, meet the strategic plan and the goals that have been set out and that we've been charged with by our members. And then subsequent to that, there is a meeting with that leadership team and I might also mention here that Travis is very much a part of the leadership team in the Texas Realtors hierarchy and in its bylaws. Travis is a voting member of our leadership team. Um, the elected leadership team then sits down with Travis after we've had those other two uh, sessions and we literally list a set of priorities and goals that we ask him and his staff to, uh, to attempt to achieve during the coming year. That way he has something in writing, and, and I will tell you that he's very much a part of that listing. He brings us what he thinks are, are most important, and we take him what, what we think are most important. We merge those two, and we set out a list of key objectives and priorities for the coming year, never losing sight of the original strategic plan that we started from. Travis, do you wanna take it from there? Oh, this is an important element for what Cindy just built up on our collaboration of jointly coming up with what those key goals are, are going to be. Because if we're not on the same path, then we're not going to have common goals. And if we don't have common goals, we're not going to be having effective communication. And so what we do now that we have this is I use the, that uh, top list of goals as, uh, as what we'll do for my evaluation. Uh, I want to be held accountable as the CEO for this organization. I want something that's measurable for my performance as the CEO. And so I take those common collaborative goals that we set once a year as my priorities of what I'll do. But I want to be held accountable in that evaluation. And that evaluation is done once a year. And so when, when we do that, we take the goals and we divide it into two areas. What were the results that were achieved? and what was the approach that was taken to, to achieve those goals. And that is a communication channel because it gives us the opportunity in advance to know what the expectations are from a leadership perspective, but also the expectations that I can have as the organization's CEO. So this relationship that we have, this best practice of enhancing communication is all based on the priority of goal setting. And as we summarize what we have here, uh, I think it's important to say that there are three critical uh, issues in association management between the elected leadership and the, the CEO of the organization. And, and I summarize those with three points. Number one 
is that this accomplishes a core standards requirement to have a strategic plan and common goals. And number two on core standards, it accomplishes the core standard of having an annual evaluation for the association executive. And number three, which I think is probably the most important one, is that it creates a path, it creates a plan, it creates common ground, and it has expectations to enhance the relationship uh, between the association executive and the association uh, chairman and our leadership team. So we take that priority and say our priority is to achieve and evaluate our strategic plan. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Travis and Cindy. Um, and I think the value of the strategic planning and the goals and especially evaluating everything afterwards is so important. Um, so that's wonderful. I saw some questions come in on that. I also saw some questions come in for Laura and Rennie. So um, we are gonna save the questions till the end, uh, but keep those questions coming in and um, because it's all very interesting stuff. And, a lot of questions about whether they will be able to receive the slide deck afterwards. And yes, we will make that available to everyone. So um, now I'd like to introduce introduce Ruth Hackney and um, and her president, uh, Cindy Olsrud, to discuss fostering relationships, leaders, quality time, and good communication. So Ruth, would you like to take it away? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kyle. Um, well, I think one of the interesting things about the relationship between Cindy and I is that I've only been with the association for six months now. Um, she had already been selected into her leadership, leadership position when I came on board. Um, and so we kind of had to play a little bit of catch up. And um, I, so some of these things that we're talking about, I think they go really far back in terms of cultivating those new leaders. But um, keep in mind that I think that as long as you're clear on your goals and um, and you communicate frequently, you can really overcome just about anything. Uh, I think for me, one of the most important things about new leaders is um, making sure that you cultivate the right ones. Um, Laura and Remy and Travis, you guys all talked about these qualities about wearing the uh, board hat instead of uh, an individual hat. That doesn't come easily to every single person. So as leadership, um, you need to cultivate, but also as your, the AE, you need to cultivate the right kind of leaders. Um, and it's important too that those leaders aren't just people that you get along with, uh, but that they will challenge the association and move us forward. I know that um, Cindy, you had uh, some thoughts about making sure that we ask the right people. Yeah, I think it's really important. Oh, you got muted, Cindy. Hello? Okay, sorry about that. Um, you know, I think it's really important that you um, seek out those people and um, ask them. Um, let them know why you think that they would be good in that position um, and kind of what they bring to the table. And I, I think that's really important. I mean, everybody likes to be asked, but um, it's important to ask the right people who you think, um, you know, might fill into those roles nicely with the talents that they offer. Yeah, um, part of that is also the ability to really be honest with one another. Um, I have always served on nominating. I always participate in that conversation. And occasionally you'll, you'll hear a name that, um, you know, as a, as a person, they might be wonderful. As an agent, they might be really competent. But as a leader, they might have some shortfalls or maybe they have a, a sharp temper or something like that. And as the CEO who's running the organization day to day, it's important for you to be able to speak your mind and be honest and know that you're that stays within that space. Um, but at the same time, while you're, while you're encouraging folks to get involved, you also need to ensure that you're, you have a diversity of opinion, of people, of um, business practices, and the, you know, the, the types of leaders that you bring to the table. It shouldn't all look the same, and it shouldn't all think the same. Yeah, I, I think that's particularly important, um, especially with your committees and chairs and things like that. You know, it's very easy to stay kind of status quo and kind of go with the flow of what you did before. But it's also kind of nice to bring in some different people, bring in different perspectives and different views, 
and do something a little bit differently um, than maybe what you've done before with committees and chairs and things like that? Um, communication is a really big one. I think Travis and Laura did a really great job, um, of course, Remy and Cindy as well, of talking about the importance of setting your goals and setting the strategic plan for the organization. But if you're not talking about them all the time, it can be really easy to lose sight of them. Um, so making sure when you're talking about a, a board agenda or when you're talking about um, maybe a, a question you got from your member or something along those lines that we communicate about how that fits in with our goals as they are right now um, and communicate often. Um, Cindy and I are texting, we're calling each other, we're emailing quite frequently. I'm checking in with her to make sure that I'm accomplishing her goals and I know she's checking in with me um, for the same reason. So we're just making sure that we're constantly in contact with one another, um, especially if issues come up. I think this is probably the most important one for me is that when you have somebody who stepped into that leadership, leadership position, they need to understand that there's a responsibility that comes with that. And sometimes they may have to do something that's a little bit of a tough situation. Maybe they have to confront another leader. Maybe they have to address a broker who stepped out of line. Um, it's important for the leader to be the one to do that, I think. And um, um, Cindy, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I think it's just really important. As you mentioned, the communication is huge um, between everybody because that's, going to be something that we're going to be able to grow in and kind of continually move the process forward. So I think that's really, really important. Yeah. And then my, my thought, too, is uh, there's always that joke, you know, if, if no one in the realtor world is supposed to know about something, everybody knows in five minutes, right? It, it can be really easy to be a part of that gossip chain. Um, but if your volunteers see you gossiping, they're going to lose some trust in you. And so it's really important that you as a leader, as the CEO of the organization, do not participate. Obviously, it happens around you and, and you'll learn things, and, um, but don't, don't continue the chain. Make sure that they know that when they talk to you about something, when your leadership talks to you about something, that it stays with you. All right. And then um, another really fun one, I think, is that our, our volunteers are giving their time to us, to the organization. And they're not just doing it because they are on our power trip. They're doing it because they are passionate about the organization and the industry. Um, and getting to know them on a personal level um, and them getting to know you can really help to um, instill a bond so that you know how to work together much, much better. Uh, for example, when I first came to Wisconsin, I actually had the honor of going out to Cindy's little farm. She calls it Chucklehead Acres. They have many donkeys and many ponies, and it is just the funnest place. And I got to see a little bit of her world. And so it makes it when I call her, you know, at six o'clock on any weekday, and I'm, and I'm imagining her, I can imagine her, you know, there with the horses. And um, it just makes working with her so much more fun. I think it's important to, you know, get to know your people kind of outside of work because anything that's going on in their personal life is going to potentially affect what they're doing business-wise. And it could, you know, affect some of the, the decisions they're making, some of the moods that they're in and different things like that. And, and I think it's really important that at some point you just stop and just say, hey, how are you doing today? You know, what's, what's going on with you um, just on a personal level? To kind of get that information and just get them to take a breath once in a while in the crazy fast-paced environment that we we live in yeah I, I read a book recently and, and they talked about um a human's desire to fill in the story if we hear one small portion of it we have a desire to kind of fill in the rest if you know somebody and you know their background and you know their um their story it could be a lot easier to think of the positive instead of just immediately go to all the negatives that could be out there so um and then the, the other big part as well is just being flexible as AEs, as leadership, we all need to be flexible, be patient, and be kind with each other, especially at times like these where from day to day things are changing, news is um, hard to hear, and uh, we're having to take really swift actions. And, and in all honesty, none of us really know um, what the outcome is, what it, this is going to look like long term. We need, to, we need to be kind to each other. We need to be kind to our members, and we need to be kind to our leadership. And we also need to laugh a lot. Yeah. I think I think that's a big um, 
big thing is being kind. That you know, that was one of my my main messages at my installation is kind of playing the sandbox nice together instead of throwing sand at each other. And the culture of laughter. I mean, when Ruth came and interviewed, that was one thing that she said to us that really, really stuck with the search committee is the culture of laughter. That no matter what you're going through, no matter how stressed you are in your life right now, there's always got to be time to have a little bit of laughter and just kind of release things a little bit and take a little bit of a step back for a little bit. Whatever is there is going to wait. It'll be okay. Just step back and take a breath. Yep. Well, thank you, Kyle. That That is kind of our, our highlights. Thank you guys both. That was really great. And I got some wonderful takeaways from that myself that I probably could have used this week, <laughs> laughing a little bit. And um, I mean, I don't know about anybody else on the call, but who wants to go to Chucklehead Acres? Because that sounds wonderful. <laughs> Bring extra carrots. Yes. Bring extra carrots. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds great. So anyway, um, you know, so much good information in this entire call today between the you know, where the rubber meets the road with um, strategic planning and evaluating those strategic plans and just like emotional intelligence and empathy. So, uh, so much of that I think is resonating with a lot of us, especially this week, but um, you know, from some of the, the conversations that I've seen in the AEI year round Facebook page. So I hope that this session was really helpful to everyone on the call today. And I just really want to thank all of our speakers, um, Laura Crother, Brenny Dietrich, uh, Ruth Hackney, Cindy Olsred, and Travis Kessler and Cindy Bullock today. Wonderful job today. We are going to um, move on to take some of your questions here. And um, I think before, let's see, I'm seeing a lot come in, guys. So I did see one for Ruth a uh, few minutes ago. <clears throat> and this is from Monica. Ruth, are you a voting member of your committee? Of the nominating committee? I believe so. Yes. You are, okay. Um, this is a question. So in light of the shutdown in real estate activities in many states due to COVID and the heightening worry by many members about the future of their businesses, what are your suggestions for communication from the president and CEO on the topics um, to members? Anyone have anything or what they've done? So I'll be glad to take that. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to focus on is being the source of the source. Um, again, we have some special challenges because of the size and breadth of our of our membership and, and the number of local associations that we have. And in our case, we don't have a statewide edict. Our governor has left it to the individual um, counties and cities. So what, what we're doing right now is helping them keep informed with what those counties and cities are saying. Um, we're not providing legal advice as to how to interpret what they're saying, and there is a lot of confusion. We have, um, in some of those jurisdictions, uh, we're being told that uh, uh, real estate services are designated as essential services. In others, it's less, it's less clear. Um, and in, in certain others, there may be an absolute prohibition against, say, a, a specific parts of our practice, which would include like open houses or showing. So um, at, at this point, without giving legal advice or taking on association liability, we're just trying to be the source of the source and gather that information and make sure it's updated daily for our members. And, and Kyle, I'll add to that because as the state association, we're even in our staffing uh, perspective, we're having to now work remotely. And, and we've worked to that as well. And so having to do that, we're all gathering under new platforms and using uh, electronic uh, mechanisms to, to communicate for us as well. And so part of that is, is what Cindy said, the importance of what we're doing on a daily basis. Our members are looking to the association for that guidance and that resource. So Cindy and I just had a webinar this morning 
with our state association, uh, local association executives. And, and we're there uh, not to say what to do, how to do it, but to be that resource. Uh, it's all about the communication and being that landing page for guidance of where to go to get the information. Uh, and I will say, and, and my compliments to our leadership team, uh, which really speaks of the importance of the communication aspect, is that we have an opportunity to share via text, by email, and our commitment to each other going through this time, and probably ongoing as we as we do uh, uh, for the purpose of our association, the importance of communication, and that is that we're meeting uh, a couple of times a week just to look at our priorities of what we think the priority issues should be and are, so that we can be that resource uh, to do it. And it's enhanced our relationship, uh, but it's all improving the communication channels to make sure that as an association, uh, we're not there to give and set those directives, but just to give that guidance and be that resource. Thanks, Travis. Um, and I, I think this question may be for you as well, is that um, how does this strategic plan information inform the business plan for, for you? Do you use your business plan as a guide to reach the strategic objectives throughout the year, or do you simply, simply use the strat plan as a guide and do not develop a business plan? You may have addressed that in your remarks. You know, and, and I'll elaborate a little bit on that, as our strategic plan is really a broader vision for this organization. Uh, everything that we are doing in our strategic plan falls under three pillars. Uh, whether it's professionalism, advocacy, or our tools and resources. So everything that we have, we're trying to keep it at a 30,000-foot level on a strategic plan. Our strategic plan is not a to-do list. Uh, our strategic plan is the roadmap for, for how we're going to guide the association on our principles and our priorities. And so what Cindy was referring to, that when we meet once a, once a year to look at what we can collaboratively do together, uh, that collaboration is based on looking at that plan now let's look at some of the actionable strategies that we really can accomplish uh, in this next 12 month period. So that we want to call that a business plan or I, I just call it a priority setting plan. And that is where that collaboration is so important that when we pick our five, eight, 10 different priorities that, that I'll be held accountable uh, to, uh, the, the setting for that is done in coordination with our strat plan but it is, it has to tie to that strat plan, but those are different and separate actionable strategies that we do uh, as a team uh, with leadership and then my role as the CEO. So this is a question for all you guys regarding the strat plan. Um, do you feel like in light of what has happened in the last couple months, is that going to change your strategic planning through the next six or eight or 10 months? What do you think? I think probably um, a strat plan and a budget, you know, they're, they're, they're concepts that we put down on paper um, that, are, that are intended to be kind of direct to the organization. Um, I mean, if your strat plan includes like specific goals, maybe technology development or something like that, I could see those things being delayed a little bit. Um, but ultimately, if your strat plan is talking about increasing technology adoption, well, this actually is pushing that up quite a bit. Um, if your strat plan is, um, you know, talking about maybe something to do with evaluating your services, again, this might be able to um, push that up a little bit. So, I think everybody's strat plan is going to it's going to really vary. Um, if it's if it's just talking about holding a lot of education classes, yeah, you're probably going to have to reevaluate that because you can't have large groups of people together at this point, and we don't know when this is all going to be over. So, I think I, you just have to be flexible, um, and leadership has to understand that. And your and, and you know maybe we're not maybe your plan was to have a lot of larger classes, but in light of what's happening right now maybe now we look at webinars and we can really uh, exploit that tool. Um, so yes, we're gonna have to shift, but I still think we can be moving down that path as we shift. The biggest change for us in that direction is that uh, our, our strat plan is, is, is very broad. Uh, it's the visionary aspect. And, and I saw a chat that came up with a question of what those three pillars are again. And those three pillars are professionalism, advocacy, and tools and resources. 
And so as a result of that, yes, are we making adjustments in our plan? And, and Cindy, you can attest to this and, and respond as well. Uh, yes, we are. We're having to respond totally differently than, than, uh, than what we had planned to do. But what it will do is help us plan for the future. Uh, we're, we're learning a lot about how to better manage in times like this uh, from tools and resources for our brokerage community, but also in how we operate and manage our Realtor Association offices. Uh, we have not ever been a remote uh, staffed office. And, and I will tell you, we had to learn to do and, and practice what I will call crisis management. And that is that uh, learning how to do business differently. And is that a, a changing uh, benchmark for us? The answer is yes. Will that change the future for how we operate? The answer is yes. And, and I think looking at this for the future, it will change in our operational administrative guidelines of what we do, how we operate internally and externally that will help shape our future as well. I, I agree. I, I like to the, the crisis management thing. Uh, again, if the culture was right to start with, if there was the truth and the transparency and the trust that was all in place, most of us have been able to take and turn that. Um, at, at the strategic plan still has the vision of where we want to go, and I'll, I'll echo what Ruth said about that. We're not necessarily having to drive away from that, but yes, are we having to reprioritize and look at timelines? Absolutely. Um, uh, our next our next big challenge will be um, how the 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 um, circumstances that we're in right now will affect the current budget and how it will affect the the uh, budgeting process for next year when we're going to be going into that process without the tools that we normally would need for projections uh, because those may not be in place at the time we have to talk about that. So there are some new challenges, but because of that culture, which is which is probably overrides in importance every other thing we've talked about. Um, we've we've got the tools in place and the trust in place to to do that. Um, and and Travis, our, as a CEO, I can't I I can't um, overemphasize the value of having um, his his expertise and having a staff that was ready, willing, able to respond to the absolute unthinkable, something that's never even crossed our minds as a possibility, or at least my mind as a possibility, and watch how incredibly well the staff transitioned. Yeah, I, I was gonna, gonna uh, suggest like Cindy that you, you have to have that level of trust there, but one of the things that as an organization we talk about every year is evaluating and our, our programs, products and services that we offer. And that, is a, that is a measure that, that we have um, to, to make sure that we're servicing our members. And I feel like this is gonna be an excellent opportunity for us to evaluate the programs that we're offering and to be more efficient and operate more effectively. And we might be able to get rid of some sacred cows that we've been wanting to get rid of or maybe that, that we didn't realize we had. So I, I truly, truly believe that, that despite this horrible event that we're having to live through right now, I believe that on the other side of it, we are gonna come out stronger. We will probably have a, a strengthened and renewed spirit within our organization on all three levels local, state, and national, and, and I really, really believe that the value of membership is going to resonate more poignantly than it ever has with our members. I totally agree with you, Laura. I, I, I think we discussed it when we were in the practice mode for, for practicing our session today, and uh, I think we all have agreed that we've seen a lot of creativity, a lot of innovation, and um, you know, it's just going to get better. You know, it's going to force us to flex and, and pivot, as we've all been saying. Some of the, the key words for the week or couple weeks. Um, before we move on from Laura, we've had a number of requests to repeat the name of the book that you referenced. And uh, I'm going to try to put that into the chat. The name of the book is Your direct Director Hat. A Guide to Serving as a Director on a Board, and the author is G. Zadel, Z-A-D-E-L. Your director hat. Can you repeat that one more time?
Laura. Laura, can you repeat that one more time, please? Yep. The, um, the book is Your Director Hat, A Guide to Serving as a Director on a Board by G. Zadell, Z-A-D-E-L. And I'll also put that in the chat. Well, thank you. Sure. Okay. I've kind of, I've tried to put that in, but um, Laura, if you could put that in, that would be so helpful. Thank you. And then <clears throat> Travis, someone had asked what you had mentioned before about what are the three pillars? Someone wanted that repeated. Yes, to repeat that, uh, the three brand pillars that we have that guide our principles for our strat plan are professionalism, advocacy, and tools and resources. And so obviously, uh, professionalism deals with everything that we touch from our messaging uh, to professional development and the delivery of those uh, services that enhance that uh, for, for member, member engagement. Uh, on the advocacy side, that's in everything from political, legislative, advocacy, consumer engagement, and our PAC fundraising, and tools and resources are the elements that help create success out of our products, programs, and services for them. Perfect. All right, thank you. Thank you, Travis. Um, so I'm not seeing, I, I think we covered most of the questions here. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed one, and I, I believe we have two more minutes left on the session. So. <clears throat> Does anyone have any input for your best practice for conflict resolution between board members and the EO? And, you know, we may have already covered this. Um, anybody? I, th I think having conversations um, and just like, honestly, just kind of hashing it out. Um, but then one of the things that I talked about with Cindy was that um, occasionally you may have a leader who you just can't seem to reach and who maybe just has a problem with you for whatever reason, and it's really hard to communicate with them. Um, and that's the time where you really need to have the right kind of leader as your president. Uh, I can only think of one time in my career where I had to do this, but um, I had a member of my board who just didn't want to hear me. And I asked my president and president-elect at the time to have a, a chat with them and just try to figure out what the issues really were about. Um, and then being able to step up and just confront the issue, it, it fixed it. And I know that, that probably isn't the case all the time, um, but sometimes, in, in, in the wise words of my very good friend, Jim, uh, putting a volunteer between yourself and a problem is the best way to handle it. I think it's really important that, you know, from both sides that both people are heard. They, they have to have a voice. and um, you have to let them be heard. And that's really important. So whether it's you making that connection or it's somebody else on the board or a volunteer or something like that, um, it's really important to find out exactly what the root of that problem is and then to make sure that both voices are heard. I think those are excellent points and something that is very valuable to close on. So I'd just really like to thank all of our speakers today, Laura Crowther, Rennie Dietrich, Cindy Bullock, Travis Kessler, Ruth Hackney, and Cindy Oltsred. I want to thank you guys for participating today and giving us that great advice. I think your peers really um, appreciated hearing from you. I know I did, and, um, and, and just thank you. Um, you guys, when this session ends, I just want to let you know that we're going to be placing it on the AEI landing page, record the recording. You'll be able to access it there. Everyone who is on the call today will be receiving an evaluation form, so we'd appreciate it if you take the time to fill that out. And be, look, be on the lookout for the upcoming dates and times of future sessions. Next week, we're planning a session on uh, legal um, legal key programs and, and topics that you need to be aware of as an association, especially during this time. So be on the lookout for that. We're going to be placing it into the AEINS, the AE 
uh, I year-round Facebook page, your hubs, um, and if you need anything else, just let us know. There's the contact info up there, and hope you guys have a good rest of your week. And thank you again, speakers. Thank you. Have a good day.